edifying and interesting conversation at this lunch where we are honored to host uh, His Excellency Najib uh, Bouguera, the ambassador from Algeria. This is not an issue that, that um, is frequently talked about in this town in comparison to Israeli conflict in the Gulf, but I think we should recognize that, that Algeria is an extremely important country, both geographically um, in the neighborhood and actually in the case of the United States, um, apart from a little interim period between 1967 and 1974, the United States has had excellent relations with um, Algeria, and uh, the history goes way, way back. I was looking today, even as far as the naming of Santa Monica after St. Augustine's mother, mother uh, which is something I never knew. Um, and today, I think, we're particularly interested in the cooperation between the United States and uh, Algeria. Um, for a whole number of reasons, but uh, we work very closely on anti-terrorism, and I think the ambassador can add a lot to uh, our discussions by telling us about Algeria's involvement in anti-terrorist measures. And of course, um, Algeria is a major fossil fuel producer and uh, one of the closest uh, trading partners with the United States. So I think there are good reasons to, to be interested in this subject. And in particular, I think this in February, because as I understand it, your, your presidential elections are in April. And uh, this will be a matter of some interest to everybody. Um, and I'm certain you can say a few words about that. Also. Um, We've been doing quite a lot of work here at the center on the environmental challenges, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa. And needless to say, Algeria is a, a country like all its neighbors that, that faces um, huge challenges from uh, climate change and particular desertification and rising sea levels. And uh, this is something I think we might also discussed this morning. So our ambassador has um, the most distinguished career, and perhaps the best way to describe it is just to read off the countries he's been ambassador to. Um, Zambia, Niger, China, Germany, and now the United States. That's quite a record, sir. And uh, we welcome you here to the center. And Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I'm so happy to see you here. And uh, I feel uh, a little bit uh, privileged to be with you today in this uh, inspiring atmosphere of the center. I would like to thank you all of, all of you, and particularly Mr. George Peebe, the Vice President of the Center for the National Interest for the kind invitation extended to me to speak before you, as well as Mr. Geoffrey Kemp, the Senior Director for Regional Security, I will be our moderator. I do appreciate the opportunity to uh, offer to me to address this prestigious gathering on an issue of uh, great interest to both our countries. <coughs> Algeria's role in combating uh, terrorism and uh, other security challenges facing the country and the region. Allow me first of all to say a few words about the state of the relations between Algeria and the United States. Uh, our two countries share a long history of friendly ties that date back to the 5th of September 1795, almost 227 years since we signed our Treaty of Peace and Amity, which is still valid today. Today, the same uh, friendship is very much vivid, 
and defines the relations between Algeria and the United States. For the last several years, Algeria and the United States have developed a strategic partnership that covers many areas, thanks to the trust, mutual respect, and shared values that characterize our uh, relations. Both countries have been able to maintain a strong and continued dialogue and close consultation on bilateral issues, as well as on international and regional issues of mutual interest. The level and intensity of official exchanges reflects the commitment of both governments towards closer political and security cooperation. This is also well manifested by the existence of what we call a joint strategic dialogue, which met recently, in fact, last month here in Washington, at the level of uh, both uh, foreign ministers. And uh, we have discussed a wide range of uh, issues pertaining not only to our bilateral relations, but also to a variety of issues of common interest, including the fight against uh, terrorism and violent extremism. We have also put in place a joint military dialogue, which meets every two years at the level of defense officials to discuss issues pertaining to military cooperation between the two countries, and a mechanism uh, for regular consultations on security issues at many levels not to mention a mechanism called TIFA for the enhancement of the economic, business, and investment cooperation between the two countries. Ladies and gentlemen, Algeria, like many countries in the region, is facing security threats from numerous challenges. These challenges include the persistence of the threat posed by terrorist groups in the region, the return of foreign fighters, terrorists, and their families, the financing of terrorism and its connection with international organized crime, the prevention of radicalization and urgent need for de-radicalization, the growing trend of Islamophobia in some non-Muslim countries, its use in internal politics, and its negative impact on social cohesion and common values, and also some foreign military intervention in countries' internal affairs. I will limit myself to discussing some of these challenges while not minimizing the importance of, the, of each of other challenges, which could be discussed later during our debate. As you know, during the 90s, Algeria went through a national tragedy engendered by the terrorist aggression that targeted the countries the Algerian people and their institutions. That period is called in Algeria the Black Decade. While organizing the security response to this aggression in order to protect the population, the institutions and the whole country against terrorism, my country has gradually implemented a set of policies which have proven their worth and made it possible for the country to live today in peace, stability and security. These policies are based on the belief that the security option, while essential, is not sufficient on its own. Among the principles on which these policies are based, the fight against the factors of marginalization and exclusion, the promotion of social justice and equal opportunity, national reconciliation, the promotion of democracy, the rule of law, good governance, human rights and fundamental freedoms, and the independence of justice all play a central role. The extremist discourse based on the logic of exclusivity and exclusion is defeated, devalued, and emptied of its substance and its scope by various levels that underpin the stability and durability of modern societies. Justice and good governance strengthen the citizens trust in their public institutions. Democracy consolidates freedom of expression. It reveals the extremist discourse and all the violence it conveys. It contributes to its marginalization and to its rejection by the population and exposes its supporters to the rigor of the law. In truth, 
democracy stands out as the best antidote to violent extremism and terrorism. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in combating terrorism, my country has led the fight on several fronts. The first one involved action by security forces, which was led in strict observance of the laws of the Republic and the commitments of the Algerian state with regard to protecting human rights and fundamental freedoms. These actions helped protect the lives of people, preserve national unity and territorial integrity of the country, and ultimately affirm the laws of the Republic over the entire national territory. When the nuisance capacity of the terrorist group was defeated in 2011, the state of emergency put in place in 1994 was lifted. The second was to confront the economic and social issues faced by our people, particularly the youth. The development program undertaken by the government, <coughs> education, health, housing, transport, job creation and infrastructure in general, helped increase and improve the standard of life, thus annihilating any support from the population to the terrorist groups, which find themselves totally isolated and easy target for the security forces. The third one, the national reconciliation advocated by the President of the Republic, Mr. Abdelaziz Bouteflika, and implemented under, under his leadership with the massive support of the Algerian people via referendum, sacralizes the human life and places it above all other consideration. It is based on the fundamental values of tolerance, dialogue, living together in peace, mutual acceptance and respect for differences. The national reconciliation policy went through three phases. In 1995, the policy of Rahma, clemency. In 1999, the policy of civil concord approved by an overwhelming majority in a popular referendum. And in 2005, the charter for peace and national reconciliation also approved by a massive majority through a referendum. The objectives of this policy were to end violence by peaceful means and avoid further loss of lives. It was based on four main principles, which are one, respect by everyone of the constitution, the national laws, and the democratic and republican system, two, national solidarity towards all victims of the national tragedy without exception or discrimination. Three, recognition of the state's institution's role in protecting the country against terrorism. And fourth, on the conditions of repentance and the respect for the Republican order, give the persons who choose the path, the path of violence a chance to return to society. Where were excluded from the benefit of this policy, the terrorists who committed massacres, rapes, or used explosives in public space. All terrorists who surrendered themselves to the authority in the country or abroad were legally accountable for their acts. The penalties were either reduced or suppressed following the conclusions of individual judiciary inquiries. Compensations were paid to families of all victims of terrorism on the basis that all of them were considered as victims of national tragedy. The policy allowed thousands of terrorists to renounce violence and return to their families. In a short time, it brought peace, security, and stability to the country. In its 2017, Global Law and Order Report, the Gallup Institute in Washington ranked Algeria in the seventh position among the safest country in the world. The fourth front was to consolidate the state, strengthen democratic institution and advancing social justice, human rights and fundamental liberties. We are convinced that partic participatory democracy and the rule of law as well as socioeconomic development based on social justice and equal opportunities are solid bulwarks against propaganda of extremism, 
and its recruitment campaigns targeting vulnerable young people. The fifth involves de-radicalization, meaning the ideology behind the narrative of the extremists. That includes consolidating the fundamentals of our national religious referent through the promotion of the culture of authentic Islam, which advocates humanism, tolerance, and social harmony. These measures taken in this context include preserving our religious referent from the influence of ideas contrary to our national religious referent, recovery by the mosques of their genuine religious, cultural, and educational role, introduction of the prevention against terrorism and extremism as a topic in sermons delivered by imams as a subject matter in the curriculum of schools and in the program of religious event. Involvement of male and female religious advisors in grassroots awareness programs against the phenomenon of violence and extremism. Reorganization of process and issuance authority of fatwa or decree, religious decree. Creation of national observatory to combat religious extremism. Training of imam to serve as religious leader for the Algerian living abroad. And involvement of schools, media, and civil society in combating terrorism and extremist, violent extremism. Ladies and gentlemen, located in a pivotal geographical area between Europe, Africa, and the Arab Muslims world, and bordered by a Mediterranean Sea whose strategic importance for peace, security, but also trade and international economic cooperation is vital, Algeria is today a secure country that lives in peace and enjoys great stability in an area marked by great turbulences due to the crisis experienced by some neighboring countries, the persistence of the terrorist threat, and the phenomenon of massive clandestine migration, which also poses serious challenges to the stability and security in the region. Let me, at this stage, highlight the fragility and volatility that distinguish certain regions of our direct geopolitical environment, particularly in Libya and the Sahel, and the efforts that my country makes to contribute to overcoming differences and restoring peace, stability, and security as effectively as possible. I would like, first of all, to emphasize that the action my country takes to this end is based on clear principles, namely the principle of non-interference in the affairs of others, a quintessence to all parties, position, and interest, and ownership of crisis and conflict resolution processes without interference of foreign pressure. This action is also based on the respect of territorial integrity of the countries concerned, for their sovereignty and their national unity, and also based on the preservation of their national cohesion. Thank you. It is also always in line with the spirit and the letter of the United Nations Charter, and in strict compliance with the international law and universal values that transcend conjectures and contribute to bringing individuals and people closer together. Today, taking these same principles as point of reference, my country invests effort and is fully committed to peace process in Libya, Mali, and Western Sahara, and develops a multidimensional cooperation in the fight against the scourge of terrorism and violent extremism, together with, with its northern and southern neighbors, as well as with other partners. In the Libyan crisis, Algeria, as a neighboring country, fully supports the efforts and the roadmap of the United Nations for a political solution between all Libyan parties without foreign interference and in respecting the sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity, unity and national co cohesion of this brotherly country. We maintain a position of equidistance with all parties, but at the same time, we have regular 
contacts with them. In Mali, Algeria remains fully committed to the implementation of the Algiers Peace Agreement by all signatories parties, despite the proliferation of acts of violence and terrorism. In Western Sahara, my country supports the effort of the United Nations for the exercise by the people of this non-self-governing territory of their inalienable right to self-determination in accordance with the relevant Security Council resolution and international legality. It is in this spirit and on this basis that Algeria, as a neighboring country and an observer of the settlement process, just like Mauritania, the other neighboring countries, has always supported the efforts of the personal envoy of the UN Secretary General for Western Sahara to find a mutually acceptable political solution to this conflict, which will provide the people of Western Sahara the, for the self-determination. Ladies and gentlemen, let me finally emphasize that on the issue of terrorism, the quality and effectiveness of the cooperation between Algeria and the United States is a source of satisfaction to both countries. Algeria and the United States as founding members of the Global Forum Against Terrorism are playing a leading role in shaping a coordinated global response to this multifaceted threat to the international peace and security. Today, Algeria is a strong and reliable partner in the fight against terrorism and violent extremism. The United States and other partners rightly believe, as President George W. Bush put it, that Algeria brings a unique perspective to this fight thanks to our long experience in combating this scourge. Indeed, Algeria is one of the very few countries which confronted successfully terrorism. Not only did we fought alone, but we defeated terrorism. We restored the security in the country and affirmed its stability in a very challenging regional environment. Through all the measure, measures which I underlined above, taken by my country, Algeria has accumulated a substantial experience in combating terrorism and extremism. And we, as always, stand ready to share this experience with countries facing similar problems. We have, in coordination with our American partners, organized in Algiers several conferences intended to put that experience in the table to be shared with others. In April 2015, a conference on social networking and internet in the fight against terrorism. In July 2015, a conference on de-radicalization in September 2016, a conference on democracy as the best tool to combat terrorism and violent extremism. And in July 2016, a conference on national reconciliation. All these events will hopefully contribute in better organizing our global fight against terrorism and violent extremism. Thank you all for your kind attention. And of course, I remain at your disposal for answering your question if there are any. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I put you a glass of water. Thank you. Um, so I will take uh, take a, a, a list of the names of people who wish to ask questions and comments. And uh, before you ask your question, please state who you are and what affiliation you have. And while you're all thinking about the wisdom of your questions, um, let me just begin by asking you. Uh, a very easy question. Um, I understand you have presidential elections uh, very soon. Could you, what can you tell us about them and when will we know the results? And should we expect any significant changes in the leadership? I really don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, what I can tell you is that uh, the uh, presidential uh, elections are uh, Of April. 18th of April. Yeah, okay. that's uh, in a little bit over two months. Right now, the uh, potential candidates are uh, trying to uh, to compile 
the uh, necessary signatures, as you know, according to electoral law in Algeria, to be a candidate, you need to have 60,000 signatures from citizens or 6,000 signatures from elected citizens throughout the to at least 25 provinces among the 48 existing in Algeria. So uh, for the moment, we have close to 200 potential candidates. Uh, but I don't know who will be able to uh, get those uh, signatures and therefore be a, uh, a candidate for the coming elections. OK, thank you very much. It's going to be interesting. So uh, Ed, you were the first. So. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, Ted Katouf, uh, former US diplomat, president of Amity East. Uh, <coughs> The Maghrebi states, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, face very, A, your, your brotherly countries, you're uh, very similar in composition and uh, many uh, culture, history, and the like, and you uh, all face challenges from uh, terrorism and extremist groups, uh, and yet, Throughout the Arab world, it's not in the Maghreb, but throughout the Arab world, we see intra-Arab uh, intra disputes uh, that get in the way of cooperation and uh, uh, development and the like. Uh, you touched on the uh, Western Sahara and Algeria's commitment to the UN process mm -hmm. and international uh, legitimacy. Could you comment to what extent uh, Algeria and Morocco are able to cooperate despite this, the, the decades of tension over this issue and in what areas uh, it prevents you from dealing with one another. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, even before our respective independence, the countries of the Maghreb have always tried to work towards the construction of what we call the United Maghreb Arab. And we have been making efforts for a certain uh, number of years, but unfortunately, fortunately, uh, we could not move very much ahead uh, because of some differences brought in between the countries of the Maghreb. Although, and I can tell you, that Algeria is the only single country in the Maghreb who has signed and ratified all the agreements put forward by the Union, Union of the Maghreb, the Arab Maghreb. Algeria is the only one. So we have that issue of uh, Western Sahara, which have, has been with us for so many years. Western Sahara was on the agenda of the United Nations since 1965. During those years, we worked together, Algeria, Morocco, Mauritania, and Tunisia, to, uh, and my good friend, whom I uh, welcome here, the ambassador of Spain is here, to try to work with Spain to get the decolonization process up to its end, so that the people of Western Sahara can get his right to self-determination. So happened what happened in 1975. That Spain was in, uh, in a particular situation it was easy for Morocco to invade and occupy the, the, uh, the, the territory. And we have been since that invasion of the territory, calling for Morocco and the Sahrawis through the Front Polisario Front to uh, negotiate a political solution which will, will allow the people of that territory to get his right to self-determination. That was the position of Algeria. Until now, we have never changed. We say that this is an inalienable right for the people of that territory. We have supported all the attempts by the United Nations to solve that issue. From uh, the former Secretary of State James Baker in 1997 until today with the former German uh, president trying to find a solution. We have always been supporting that process, the one process. When it comes to the bilateral uh, relations with Morocco, we have always said that. Say that. We are ready to work with Morocco to improve our bilateral relations. 
on one condition, that our brother in Morocco should not come with a condition to Algeria. Either you change your position on the issue of Western Sahara, and then we can improve, or you don't change, and then we don't, we don't improve. So we have always said that, said that, please separate the two. The issue of Western Sahara is in the United Nations, is between Morocco and the Polisario Front. The issue of bilateral relations, we can work together. We have had some problems, serious problems, uh, legal migration, uh, trafficking, uh, drug trafficking, tra tra trafficking, and you have thousands and thousands of tons of drugs pouring in Algeria. Say, so, okay, let's meet and work together those, uh, those problems. Fortunately, there was no answer, and we are still at that, at that stage. But it doesn't change our political uh, will to work uh, for the betterment of our uh, relations. Uh, not, uh, we are working very closely with, uh, with Tunisia to get rid of uh, terrorism and uh, violent extremism. Uh, uh, our relations with Mauritania are very good. Uh, we are trying to restore peace, security, and stability in Libya with a lot of difficulties, mainly due to foreign interferences. But on that issue, we work hand in hand with our American friends because we share the vision for Libya, for a Libyan solution between Libyan parties. So uh, this is it. So if I just uh, make sure I understand, there isn't much cooperation on terrorism between Morocco and Algeria because of this uh, Polisario Western Sahara no, issue. No, no, no. There are there are uh, between uh, specialized services. There are. Uh, Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. And I can assure you that uh, right now, if you have a look at the uh, trade relations, Morocco is still our first partner in the Maghreb area. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you. Hi. <clears throat> Ambassador, nice to see you again. My name is Jeff Porter. Ambassador, nice to see you again. Uh, my name is Jeff Porter with North Africa Risk Consulting. Um, I'm not going to ask you about domestic affairs. Um, I, I want to take advantage of your expertise in the international arena. Um, you know, and, and during your comments, I'm always struck by how forthright and transparent it, Algeria is about its foreign policy principles. You know, and I think there's a tendency to dismiss principles as lofty rhetoric, but you know, in my years of observing Algeria, it, generally the principles are what Algeria actually implements. Um, so. <clears throat> You know, as you mentioned, Algeria has been engaged with Libya for some time. Um, uh, Algeria was initially very hesitant about the uh, the NATO intervention in, in Libya, largely because it anticipated the consequences of what would happen in destabilizing Libya. Um, there's been several efforts by Minister Mustahil uh, to jumpstart a political process. I mean, uh, under the auspices or parallel to uh, the UN process with Hassan Salami. Um, you know, then we had the the, the the Paris meeting, which didn't work, which the, the attempt by Macron to bring together Libyan actors. We had the Palermo summit, an attempt by Italy to bring together Libyan actors. That didn't work. Um, and so my question is, why, in your opinion, is the Algerian approach to the political process or a peace process in Libya not getting more attention? Um, from the international community? Uh, is it simply because you know, Minister Massa is, 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 is too busy? Um, you know, I think he's, he's in a different country every other day. Um, is it because there are historical prejudices of, among Europeans who refuse to acknowledge or are reluctant to acknowledge Algeria's role as a potential peace broker? Um, or is there distrust among regional actors as to what Algeria's intentions are? Um, in particular, I'm talking about the the foreign interference or the proxies, the benefactors that are involved in Libya. So I'm, I'm curious because Algeria has been committed to a political process in Libya for seven years, and it doesn't seem to be getting a lot of traction. So why is that? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I'll tell you that uh, maybe because uh, Algeria is the only country who does not have an agenda in Libya. Our only agenda is the Libyan agenda. The rest, all the actors, have a different agenda. 
<clears throat> and uh, in Libya, you might have as many actors as agenda. And uh, to be frank with you, the only two countries who are working for the Libyan agenda probably is Algeria and the United States. We are really seeking a Libyan solution for the Libyan by the Libyans. And we, listen, today, the only minister who can go to the east, north, west, and southern part of Libya is the Algerian minister. We have no problem whatsoever with all the Libyans. We are in good uh, relations with all the Libyans. But since we have different agenda from different actors and partners, sometimes strong one, very much involved in the Libyan crisis, it's very difficult to move ahead with the Algerian or with the Libyan agenda. It's extremely difficult. What we say is that since that doesn't work, and since our agenda is the agenda of the United Nations, we are going to put all our weight behind Mr. Hassan Salem, because his agenda is ours. He is working for a Libyan solution, which will bring Libyan together. And believe me, uh, we have said that so many times. Even our American friends, much later on, four or five years, they said we should have listened in 2012 to Algeria. It was wrong to support the NATO intervention. But that's too late. So now we need to work together to get the Libyans, and especially the Libyans who have arms. You need to get them in the process. You can't work only with the politician. You need to get those who have arms. Those are the real actors in, in Libya, to get them in the process, but on the conditions that all the external actors need to get around one agenda, which is the Libyan agenda. Thank you, sir. Okay, next. Thank you. Hi, Malka from CSIS. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I'd like to ask you about migration. It's an issue that doesn't get a lot of attention in the American press, but there's a growing debate in Algeria and North Africa about the increase in illegal migration from sub-Saharan Africa. And if we look at many of the demographic trends, uh, it points to increasing rates of illegal migration over the next decade and beyond. So my question to you is, how is Algeria thinking about addressing the challenge of growing rates of illegal migration from sub-Saharan Africa to Algeria and the potential ramifications of Algeria and the rest of the Maghreb becoming a new destination point for uh, Ill irregular illegal migration? Thank you. Thank you, Harry. You know, before, uh, before the Libyan issue, before terrorism in the Sahara. Migration was a, a regular flow from sub saharan Africa, so sometimes to Europe crossing either through Algeria or through Morocco or to Tunisia or through Libya. That was an, a, a normal uh, situation because the numbers were small one, uh, and uh, it doesn't really uh, be considered as a real problem for us or for the European uh, side. But since uh, the, uh, uh, the Libyan crisis and the uh, development of uh, terrorist uh, groups in the Sahel, migration became a, uh, an issue of different nature and different scope. Because migration was used either by terrorists to get money, or to get some of them to Europe or to Maghreb countries, used by the, the, traffic, the uh, trafficking, drug trafficking groups also. And, uh, in, and in a sense, we have noticed that from 1,000, probably every three months, trying to, uh, to, to cross into Algeria in the 70s and the 80s and even in the 90s, now we have close to 20,000 every, every day almost trying to cross. And it became a real problem 
for Algeria because most of them want to settle in Algeria. It's not any more transit country to settle there with the hope that in five, 10 years, they will have enough money to cross and to go to, 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 to Europe. And it has become a real source of uh, concern for us from the security point of view and from the uh, drug trafficking point of, point of view because many of them were caught either with arms or with drugs. And the, 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 the passer, I don't know how you call them in English, the smugglers, human Coyotes. traffickers. Coyotes. <laughs> Coyotes yeah. Yeah. They are working in close connections with the terrorist groups or with the drug trafficking groups. So really it became a, it, it became a, a real a real problem for, for, for us. We did what we had to do. We closed the border. We closed the border with Mali. The border is closed with, uh, with, with Niger, except for few uh, reasons. But in spite of that, they still keep on crossing. And we have found that uh, when they cannot succeed in crossing, they'll just dig holes and put their arms there, and they put their uh, drugs there in case they might use it later on. And each passing day, our security forces will find caches of weapons of all calibers. So we say to our European partners that we are not go Algeria is not going to be like some like some of them are asking to be a center for control now. We do our we do what we have to do, but still we believe that on the other side. Uh, for the European countries to close completely the, the doors is not the, is not also the solution. Still, doors must be still open for some sort of of, 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 of migrants. So uh, that's what we we are doing. I know that uh, uh, for a country like uh, like Spain, like Italy, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. Um, could I just build on that question and? You, you sort of implied that this is gun traffickers, smugglers, and drug trade. But to, to what extent is this the surge in migrants that you talked about also due to economic uh, migrants caused by the environmental catastrophes in sub-Saharan Africa? Certainly, certainly, certainly. Part part of the migrants are either for some of them political reason, but most of them for economic reasons. Okay. But, 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 but Jeffrey, I'll tell you, I have been involved in the uh, mediation between uh, the uh, government of Mali and uh, the Tuareg rebellion. I have been involved in the mediation between the government of Niger and the government of, uh, and the rebellion in the northern part of Mali. We have succeeded, Algeria has succeeded, for example, in attaining peace agreements. And when it comes to the implementation of those peace agreements, we have called many times on the international community to help, to help put in place some living conditions for the population to keep them there. But unfortunately, we have never succeeded. And those are very small projects. School, health, uh, uh, livestock, uh, water, uh, small projects which, which could have helped the local population to remain there and not to be used either by the terrorists or by the drug trafficking networks for, 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 for some living uh, reason. <coughs> and that was the biggest failure of the international community. Today, the agreement in Mali is in jeopardy because we cannot implement it for the lack of resources to implement it. Yes. Um. Here. Yeah. Sorry, I can't see. Here, lady here. Next. Right. Uh, you got you. Oh, uh, I, I actually didn't have my hand up, but I'll take the opportunity. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I am uh, Kelly Torrance uh, with the uh, Washington Examiner. Um, what? Uh, I mean, do you find you have all this experience? It's where you talked about having conferences, people are coming, but uh, are, are people really taking uh, your experiences to heart? Are they using 
your advice do you see places in the world perhaps you could you could tell us where that advice has been taken and you've seen some results yeah madam I can tell you that when it comes to the experience of Algeria it is it's going on in Mali the Libyans have taken good care of the Algerian experience our friends in sometimes in Egypt uh, they're having a look at the Algerian experience. Uh, I can even go as far as uh, Afghanistan when they try to learn the Algerian experience and see whether it, it is implementable there or not. But for us, what is good is that it can help. It can help. And we are sure that it can help. Even our friends in Somalia, it might help them. Uh, especially when it comes to the two, uh, the two uh, factors, national reconciliation and the de-radicalization. Those are really important. Not talking about, uh, for example, our partners in the north. With the French, we have uh, established a, a, a very concrete cooperation. We send from Algeria imams uh, to, uh, to deal with Algerians living in France. We send imams from Algiers to Germany to uh, try to, to help because we have formed a new, I'm sorry, it's not really a new type of imam, but imam very much aware of the necessity to sensitize people against extremism and against violence. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Dave Pollack, uh, formerly with the State Department, now at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. I agree and I congratulate you on Algeria's achievement of stability. And I wanted to ask you going forward if you could perhaps uh, just give us your personal idea about what is the, given that stability, but from now on, what is the single greatest unmet challenge that Algeria faces? Or to put it a slightly different way, what is the single issue on which their Algeria has the greatest potential for improvement in the future? I, I'll start with the, the security uh, issue because there can't be any development without security. We have achieved security and stability internally, but our environment is still very much insecure. We have 6,500 kilometers of border. Almost all of them insecure. We need to deal with that issue. And we are, uh, we are putting a huge amount of resources in dealing with, uh, with, with that. You remember in 2013 when a group of terrorists came through Libya to Algeria to uh, the uh, gas plant there. So we don't want that again. We are taking all the necessary measures to protect the country. That's one. Two, I think that uh, since 2014 we have uh, realized that uh, although oil and gas has helped the development of the country, we cannot continue building an economy solely on the basis of hydrocarbons. There is an urgent need for the country to diversify. And we have a huge potential to do it. We have agriculture, which could be a huge uh, tool for the economic development of the country. We have the renewable energy, the solar and the wind. We have the largest potential in the world, probably. We have, I must say, also the third largest uh, shale gas reserves. Uh, we have the industry. We have the market. So we need to work for the diversification not only of the economy, but diversification of the 
sources of revenue for the, for the country. And uh, the third one, we need to uh, work for the, uh, for the, uh, for re renewing the building of our, uh, of our nation. Uh, we were talking about the, uh, uh, as uh, Master Khatou put it, the Maghreb Union. We need to work towards that objective. Yeah. Because, because to, in today's world, you can't deal with others by yourself. You need to be within a strong group. And we can, we can be a strong, uh, strong group vis-a-vis uh, -vis our partners in Europe or vis-a-vis -vis other regrouping, uh, grouping, economic groupings. OK, so uh, thank you, David. Uh, George. Thank you, uh, George PB here with the Center for the National Interest. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your, your thoughts today. Um, I have a question about uh, the changing nature of the counterterrorist challenge. Uh, Al-Qaeda basically took a traditional approach to terrorism, uh, identifying members of secret cells, training them, funding them, helping to plan terrorist operations, and dealing with challenges like that requires following money, identifying who the members of cells are, looking at their activities. Um, those are challenging things to do, but not impossible. Um, ISIS, uh, in contrast, has taken a little bit different approach. It hasn't identified very many secret members of cells and not focused on training them or um, putting together plans for terrorist activities it has essentially tried to inspire people. It's tried to radicalize them through messaging and then letting them decide what they want to do in response to that inspiration. And that poses a very difficult challenge in the counter-terrorist area because it doesn't focus on what people are doing. It focuses on what they're thinking. Um, and it, of course, um, creates temptations to look at social media postings um, to get government to try to identify and monitor what people are thinking and who is becoming radical in an effort to get in front of some of these inspired terrorist activities. But that, of course, raises some profound questions about democracy and protecting civil rights and things like that. I'm wondering if Algeria has any experience in dealing with this new form of the problem in ways that are compatible with the democracy that you've, I think, correctly pointed out is such an important part of dealing effectively with, with the challenge of terrorism. Yeah, thank you very much, George. Yeah, it, it is, uh, it's really an, an important segment of, uh, of uh, the, fi the fight against uh, terrorism and Extremism. And that's why we say uh, there is an urgent need for de-radicalization. And that de-radicalization prepares uh, citizens from, from the kindergarten to the to, 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 uh, to university. We need to uh, uh, make people aware that, uh, 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 that the true, for example, for, for us, that's why we say going back to the national religious referent. Our national religious referent is, the, is the Islam, which have been with us for thousands of years. An Islam of humanism, an Islam of, uh, of tolerance, an Islam of peace, of living, living together in peace. And uh, that's the, 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 the main uh, uh, mission for uh, any given state, any given government. We, may, we need to make people aware, aware of, 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 of that. And uh, uh, today, we have put, as an international community, we have put in place very good tools. For example, when it comes to uh, the financing of terrorism. There are still some loopholes, but in general, it works well. It works well. Uh, we need to tackle more seriously, for example, the traffic, drug trafficking, because it's a source of real financing for the terrorist groups, particularly when it comes to the Sahel uh, region. We need to deal with the issue of the return of foreign fighters. And let me remind you that in the 90s, how it started in Algeria? How? 3,000 Algerians mobilized by some countries 
sent to Afghanistan to combat the so-called the, the Soviet invasion, and then they came back through Bosnia and Chechnya, Bosnia to Algeria, and started what they call their uh, religious war. That's how it started. So we don't want the returning foreign fighters to restart again what we, what. Fortunately, in Algeria, look at the data available. Uh, we have very few, about 175 of them, which have which are within the ISIS uh, ranks. 170. Less than 175, and most of them coming for you from European countries. But still, our neighboring countries have thousands of them, and they will be back. We have to deal with this issue. Thousands from Morocco, th more from Tunisia, more from Libya. We have to deal with those issues because now they have to leave Iraq and Syria. Where they will be going? To the, to the Sahel, because it's how do you say, non-state, uh, non-government uh, area. So they believe it's easy for them. But they won't remain in Sahel. They will target countries around the Sahel, including Algeria. That's, we, we need, that's why we need to work to, uh, to, together. But it is more important to tackle the issue of the discourse of the, and the narrative of the extremists. And you are right. We need to make sure that the civil society as a whole works against that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that uh, uh, extremism or that violent discourse. And we believe, honestly, and I'm very frank with you, we believe that the best tool for the moment is democracy. It's through a democratic rule that you can fight very uh, effectively the extremist and uh, the terrorist discourse, which, as you rightly said, ISIS is, uh, at the contrary of what uh, Al-Qaeda is doing, is now uh, its preferable, preferred tool to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to engage in its, uh, in its uh, uh, terrorist or violent uh, activities. Thank you. Uh, now, I have, I have on the list uh, Rob Satloff and Mr. Al Lula here. And is there anyone I'm missing on the list? Oh. Anyone else? Okay, so well, the lady there. Uh, Rob, yeah. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I want to first, I'm Rob Satloff, the director of the Washington Institute. I want to thank you for your very important remarks. If I could ask you two questions, both about um, U.S. Algerian relations. First, in the security realm, um, could you tell us a, bit, a little bit more about uh, the, the, uh, uh, the extent of partnership with AFRICOM, what you're looking more from the United States? Um, is there um, the uh, continuation of the initiative of, uh, of intelligence chiefs in North Africa getting together under AFRICOM's umbrella that was started a few years ago? Well, what more do you want in that regard? And secondly, um, uh, uh, following on your, your very powerful uh, defense of, of democracy as the, as the antidote to extremism, um, is Algeria open to having um, American uh, 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 democracy institutions? Um, NDI, IRI, etc., um, come to uh, to observe uh, your elections and uh, and uh, confirm the depth of uh, commitment that uh, that Algeria has to democracy. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, from the, the the security point of view, I tell you that uh, our cooperation is strong, uh, and we have uh, on a yearly basis what we call the security consultation between the experts. The, I mean, official from certain number of agencies which meet to, together and exchange a lot of uh, information on uh, many, many issues. And uh, uh, not talking about the, uh, the extent of uh, the flux of visit on, uh, on uh, each uh, side, and also some agreement which we have signed together, which uh, constitute today, today a, uh, a very effective framework for development of the security cooperation between Algeria and the United States. Uh, you, uh, you talked about the AFRICOM. Uh, to my knowledge, all the uh, commanders of the AFRICOM have come to Algeria. Every year, there is a visit from the AFRICOM from Stuttgart to Algeria. And he meets almost everybody in Algiers. And we talk at length about our, uh, our uh, cooperation. 
And even when it comes to some military, how do you call it, Man, uh, maneuver military, war games, how do you call it? Maneuvers. We do have maneuvers. Maneuvers, we, we do have with the, with the, with the Americans uh, regularly, uh, probably next uh, month, the uh, Flintlock, uh, will be there also. So it is a quite regular and effective cooperation at that level, really, and we are happy with, the, with that and happy, more, uh, more happy about the results which it gives to uh, both uh, countries. When it comes to uh, democracy, uh, I say that uh, we are convinced of that. Uh, you tell me about uh, NDI, IRI, I'm pleased to tell you that both are in Algiers. So uh, they are already there. If they, and they are already working with the, uh, uh, the civil society there in Algeria. And they do uh, preach political parties and candidates on how to organize elections, how to organize electoral campaign. They are already working there. Okay. Uh, Muhammad from Muhammad Al Aula from the Indonesian Embassy. Uh, you mentioned Muhammad Al Aula from the Indonesian Embassy. You mentioned a couple of times about the, the radicalization programs uh, in Algeria. Uh, the question is. Uh, what is the effectiveness of the, the radicalization program that has been implemented in Algeria? And the second one is, uh, talking about the, the radicalizations, there is also the economic, uh, economic factors. Uh, is there any economic empowerment that is implemented in the, the radicalization program because of for those who, are, who has been de-radicalized uh, de so that they, it will be prevent them from uh, rejoining the radical group uh, in the future? Uh, thank you. Uh, the, the, the first aspect of the radicalization, for example, in the 90s, all the mosques in Algeria were, were between the hands of the radicalized people, of the extremist people, most of them. And that's why it was, at the beginning, very difficult to fight the, uh, the, the violent discourse which led to the, ter the, ter the ter terrorists. Today, no more of that. 16,000 Mosques are controlled by imam format with our national religious referent. Each Friday you have the same discourse by imams against extremism, against violent uh, discourse. That has been put in place. And when it comes to, uh, to, to, uh, to civil society, even to the media, they are playing also that same role. They are sensitizing people. We have few mosques where you can from time to time to hear different voices, which is normal in a democratic uh, country, but still the majority, the great majority of the mosques are in that, in that, in that shape. Uh, yes, I, I totally agree with you. Apart from the compensations which I talked about, those returning from the, uh, from the mountains, surrendering their weapons, they have been compensated and helped to either find a job or create their own uh, business. We have put in place two, uh, two state agencies who uh, are making very good use of microcredit to young people to create their own business. Any young, any young Algerian can get uh, some million dollar, some yeah. dollar, yeah. the uh, approximately hundred thousand dollars to create his own business. Uh, with a loan from the bank, no interest whatsoever, and many of them have created uh, their own uh, jobs. It, it has been a good, uh, a, a good uh, way of uh, dealing with unemployed young people, and a good way also of uh, separating them from the possibility of uh, uh, getting lured by, uh, by, uh, by uh, extremist uh, discourse. So this is a good experience which we believe could help other countries. It is costly from the economic and the financial point of view, but, but it is giving very good results from the security, political, and social point of view. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Blahos, and then... Uh, Mike Blahos, uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, could you uh, possibly address um, the dynamics of the relationship today between uh, Algeria and France, and not simply in terms of um, security interests, uh, Mali, et cetera, et cetera, 
maybe uh, but but the, the larger relationship in terms of of um, its uh, its uh, depth and uh, its uh, its direction today. The, the both nations they're still connected in some way. So I'd I'd like to know what your take is on that. It has been uh, always a very difficult and sensitive relation due to the past. I mean, uh, Algeria was uh, colonized by France for 132 years. It was not an easy colonization, believe me. It was a hard one. We suffered a lot. We lost a million and a half people <coughs> during that war, many more during the uh, centuries uh, a century of uh, our century of colonization that's why it is it is really difficult uh, difficult but it is a uh, an important uh, relations on all aspects from uh, the political uh, point of view to cultural point of view to economic and financial point of view we have had uh, many setbacks with uh, with france I suppose that if you ask them, they will tell you also we have had many setbacks with, the, with, with Algeria. But it wasn't an easy year. But I believe that the leadership on both sides realized that it is as important uh, uh, relations for Paris or for, for Algiers. It is, uh, we have uh, close to over, close to 2 million Algerians living in France. Uh, we have close to 50,000 by nationals French living in, in Algeria. It is also, uh, a, uh, from that human dimension, a very important uh, relations. What we uh, say to our uh, fr French partners, we need to realize that both of us are mature. And the relations between the, the two countries has to be dealt with mature countries. We have our own interest. You have your own interest. Let's see how we can find a common interest and work on that. <coughs> sometimes we do find, when it comes, for example, to e e economic and trade relations, sometimes we don't, when it comes to political issues, uh, particularly on issues of concerns to both countries. When it comes to the Sahel, we say, for example, that let's be very objective. The presence of that foreign army there, did it bring results or not? I can ask anyone who will say, tell you that for the moment it didn't. Because our position is that the countries concerned need to take true ownership of their fight against terrorism. If they don't, they won't succeed. I think what we realize in Algeria is that once you take ownership of the fighters, you will succeed. It might take time, but you will succeed. But if you realize that you can't succeed, if you don't get help from outside, then it will be more difficult for, 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 for you. This is the difference of approach between, uh, for example, between, between us. Uh, the, 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 the same goes for, uh, for, 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 for other uh, crises. In Libya, we have said that uh, NATO in, uh, uh, intervention will create a chaos in Libya. <coughs> Six, seven years later, we were right. Libya has become a nightmare for the region, and certainly for also for our uh, European partners. So we say that, I mean, uh, we are not uh, at uh, the level of France. France is a, a permanent uh, member of the Security Council. It has global strategic objectives. We are dealing with just with ourselves at the level of our region. But we say that instead of, uh, of, of spending huge resources to secure our borders, we would have used them for the economic and social development of the country if we didn't have uh, Libya. And Libya is still there. And Sahel is still there. So, uh, but uh, all in all, I think we have, uh, uh, France is our, I guess, our second partner, trade partner after China. Uh, it's an important uh, 
economic and uh, trade party to Algeria. It's an important uh, 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 political party for, for, for Algeria. We uh, have very strong, diversified, and uh, uh, historic, cultural, and education relations. Many Algerians have been trained in France. Many Algerians are still being trained in, 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 in France. Uh, hundreds of thousands, millions probably, of Algerians living in, uh, in, in France. That has brought together the two countries. But that doesn't mean that we agree on everything. We might agree on th some things, and we might disagree on others. And uh, uh, if you, uh, if you, are, uh, if you uh, try to uh, to to read the uh, French newspaper or to listen to a French TV and radio, you will think that uh, Algeria is in a state of catastrophe. Uh, but <laughs> that's it. That's France. Some people in France, they don't uh, accept the fact that Algeria is today an independent country. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, the last question here. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador Munir al Hamoud with I24 News. Uh, my first question is about... Could you, could you identify me? Yes, Munir al Hamoud, oh. I24 News. Um, you mentioned Islamophobia, and I was just wondering if you're ever concerned um, that some political discourse um, in Europe and in America might um, promote Islamophobia and in return also encourage um, radicalization and extremism. And my second question is about uh, what are the common interests that Algeria has with Russia? Thank you. Well, the, the, the first one, uh, I, I, I go back to what has been said by uh, George Bick. The uh, more than Al Qaeda, ISIS is building its discourse on the treatment of Muslims elsewhere. That's an excuse, false excuse for them. But we tell to our partners that you need to combat Islamophobia so that we don't give reason for those people to say that we are doing it also on behalf of the Islamophobia which is taking place in, in, in Europe. When I'm, uh, when I'm talking about Islamophobia, because I see how sometimes Muslim population in Muslim countries react to some events which happens against Muslims in and around the world. And sometimes when they are, uh, 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 they are open, to, uh, open to that uh, extremist discourse, they might get into that trap and say, well, after all, probably ISIS is right, because that's what happens to our uh, brethren in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in those countries. So we need to, uh, to, 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 be, uh, to take care of that. To, we need to combat uh, Islamophobia. Because in as much as we need to combat all other uh, forms of extremism and uh, all of them, because Algeria is one of the countries who has called for so many years, and in particular President Bouteflika, for the dialogue between culture and religions. He was one of the founders, of initiator of that dialogue. And today we don't talk anymore about that dialogue. Why? It has been an important tool for us. We need to go back to that dialogue and make it an effective tool in our common and global fight against uh, violent extremism. We need to continue that dialogue, not only between the religion, but also between, uh, be between, uh, between cultures. It's a way of combating uh, Islamophobia. Coming to, uh, to, to Russia, it's, it's an old uh, historical religion. Uh, but uh, since we have abandoned the one-party uh, system, things have changed, and we have developed quite strong and uh, multifaceted relations with uh, other partners. Uh, but uh, the economic field, there, are, there is not that much between Algeria and, the United States and uh, the Russia, except uh, on how to deal with the, with the, our uh, respective position on the issue of gas, production of gas and oil, which is normal in uh, our dialogue 
uh, we as OPEC members and they as non-OPEC members, my colleague from Indonesia is here to, uh, to, to, to confirm, that dialogue has been going and that uh, exchange of views has been going on for, uh, for, for years because uh, we uh, need to uh, make sure that uh, our dialogue will uh, bring us to a price which is acceptable not only to producers but also to consumers. Uh, but uh, we have had a military relations. We used to buy our military equipment from, from Russia. Uh, but uh, we started a very effective uh, policy of diversification of uh, our uh, sources of, uh, of uh, for, for uh, military equipment. In the 90s, I, I will tell you something probably which some people don't know. In the 90s, when we were facing a terrorist aggression, none of the Western countries accept to deliver to Algeria military equipment to help it combat the terrorism. They all thought that, well, it's a civil war in Algeria, we don't have to interfere in that. So the only countries were China and Russia. So we had to buy from them for our own sake, for the sake of our own national security. But uh, unfortunately, probably, after 9-11, the whole world realized that terrorism is a reality. Terrorism is a danger for the whole international community, not only for Algeria, but for the whole international community. And we need to cooperate today. And since then, yes, Algeria became a, uh, a good uh, either client or customers for some countries. We start buying from uh, Germany, from Italy, from France, from the UK, from the United States, quite a lot from here. Uh, and we are still on that uh, path of uh, diversifying our uh, sources of uh, military equipment. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. It was a very uh, um, articulate, um, overreaching, overwhelming uh, presentation, and we thank you so much. We hope you come back. Thank you very much. Yes.